I shared with you guys last week uh, the modified morning kind of prayer thought that I have. It, it's up here right here. Uh, let's, let's say this together this morning, all right? Here it is. Join with me. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today will be fruitful labor for the Lord because I am a new creation filled with the riches of Christ to bring God glory to make his kingdom visible, and to declare his grace to all the world. This is who you are. This is who you are. Uh, all of Colossians 1 and 2 was to remind you, this is who you are. Uh, you, you are new creations filled with the riches of Christ, not just to know who you are, but to know who Christ is. The one who fills you is the creator, the sustainer, uh, the one who holds the keys of life uh, and death in his hands. This is who you are, and this is who you belong to. That was chapters one and two of Colossians. When we turned to chapter three last week, we saw Paul saying to us, now live into this new life. Now that you know who you are and you know the one that you belong to, now let that new life find expression in the way that you live. Let, let, let it flow out of this new identity that you have in Christ. In the first four verses of chapter three, Paul says that we now have a new agenda. As those who belong to Christ, our agenda is no longer ourselves, our comfort, our convenience, our kingdom, what we're building for ourselves. We're now thinking about the things of God. Uh, we're now concerned with the things that Jesus is concerned about, uh, and we're getting on God's agenda, and every single one of you had an opportunity to do that this week. Man, God was at work around you, and it was inconvenient and uncomfortable, and you, you kind of had your own thing going on, but God was inviting you to step into the thing that he was doing, which is oftentimes to step into some messiness. He was inviting you to get involved with him in the things that he was doing. And so Paul says, as those who are in Christ, our mind is now on the things that are above. And then in verses 5 through 11, Paul gave us two different lists of five things that no longer belong in our lives. If we are now in Christ, there are some things that no longer belong in this new life, things from the old life that, 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 don't, that aren't to be brought over into this new life. That's called repentance. Uh, repentance is turning uh, from the old life, recognizing some things have to be left behind, and turning to this new life in Jesus. And the absence of preaching about repentance is one of the great weaknesses of American Christianity. In fact, there's a lot of people uh, in, in our culture, not in all cultures, but in our culture, who heard an invitation to follow Jesus that sounded something like this. Do you want to go to hell? I've never heard anybody answer, yeah, uh, except for when I'm places and they're playing Highway to Hell and everybody's singing along. Yeah, I don't know what y'all are doing. That's a bad idea. All right. No, nobody, they answer, do you want to go? No, nobody wants to go to hell. The next part of that often sounds like this. If you will accept Jesus into your heart when you die, you'll go to heaven. Hell, bad. Heaven, good. Uh, accept Jesus into my heart. I bring Jesus into my life. Uh, and if I accept Jesus into my life uh, and he hangs out with me, uh, then I'm gonna go to heaven when I die. Uh, that, that's the invitation many of us heard. And there's, there's some good in that. And God used that. Many of us came to Jesus through, through an invitation that sounded like that because God uses um, all sorts of things. But listen, that doesn't sound very much like what Jesus said when Jesus invited us to follow him. This is a verse we turn to over and over again because it's what Jesus spoke about over and over again. And it says, from that time, from that time, here was the consistent invitation of Jesus throughout his whole ministry. From that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. To repent means to turn away from these things. These things no longer belong in this new life, and it is to step into a kingdom that is ruled and reigned by Jesus. I am bowing to a new king. Life is no longer about me. It's no longer about my comfort. It's no longer about my convenience. It's about the agenda of Jesus Christ, and I am turning away from these things. They don't have any place in this new life, and I am turning and surrendering to this new life where Jesus is inviting me into his kingdom. I'm not bringing Jesus into my kingdom. I'm surrendering my kingdom and stepping into his kingdom where he is ruling and reigning, and there are things that no longer belong in this new life. Now, that is a lifelong process for every single one of us, 
because when we came to Jesus, we had no idea all the things we were going to surrender. But as we read his word, and as our minds are transformed and on an almost daily basis, we go, man, listen, that no longer involved, that no longer remains in this new life. And I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm reading about who I am in Christ. I'm looking at that going, that doesn't belong. And so I am repenting of that and stepping into a kingdom that is ruled and reigned by Jesus. Uh, and so that's what, what Paul has been doing with the Colossians up to this point right here. So today we're going to jump into verse 12. If you guys are new with us, we've been in Colossians for a few weeks. We've got three more weeks after this, uh, so uh, stick with me. Uh, and so let's read verse 12. Put on them as God's chosen ones. Notice here right away from the beginning, Paul's uh, again reminding them, this is flowing out of your new identity as a new creation. It's not just behavior management. It's knowing who you are. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. All right, here's another list of five. Paul gave them two lists of five things that no longer belong in their new life. Here he's given them a list of five things that do belong in this new life. Compassion, a deep sensitivity to the needs and the sorrows of, of others. Kindness, uh, a sensitive approach to others that seeks their good. Uh, humility, not thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to, and being willing to serve others. Uh, meekness. We, we use the word in our culture today, meekness would be another way to say timid. Uh, and that's not what the biblical word meekness means. Meekness is bridled power. It is power in the service of good power in the service of God. Think of a, of a giant racehorse with a bridle in its mouth. It is power under the service of God. That's what meekness is, bridled power in the service of good. Meekness, patience. Uh, the word patience is literally long-tempered, not easily provoked. Now, the thing that I think is super important for us to understand right here, these are not just five random good things that we ought to be. Uh, that, that's not what's going on here. When you think of these things, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, someone with great power and yet uses that power in the service of good, um, is there anybody that comes to mind? Compassionate, kind, humble, meek, patient. Ah, thank you. Right. Yeah. I mean, right. The answer is Jesus. That's right. Uh, so right here, he's not simply saying, um, you know, here's five good things that you ought to do. No, he's saying, you have put on Jesus, and this is the life of Jesus that comes out of those who are now in him. In fact, Paul says this in some of his other letters. He says it very literally that you are putting on Jesus. Romans, look at what he says in Romans. He says to them, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh. The same thing. He's talking about take off that old stuff, the flesh, the old life. Don't make provisions. Put on Christ. You have put on Christ. Galatians, he's saying the same thing. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. Uh, and, and so all these things that we're reading about right here, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, they are the life of Christ finding expression through us. And our hope in becoming these things is not that, that we're just gonna try real hard. It's no, hey, listen, Christ is now in me and I am in Christ. And so what is, the riches of Christ, his compassion, humility, meekness, strength, bridled power is all finding expression in me. It's Christ in me being lived out and having expression. That's why uh, these things are, are, are finding expression in this new life. Uh, j just imagine, uh, imagine that, uh, I don't know if Richard Snow's in here. This, oh, there's Richard back there. I, that's what I think. Imagine that Richard Snow comes up to me and he says, Jeff, I, I want you to build you and Susan's dream house. Some of y'all know how funny that is because I can't build anything. Uh, and, and you're like, I, I, I'm, I, you know what? That, that'd be funny. You don't want me building anything for you. Uh, and and I, I, might, I might say, Richard, there's a couple problems. One, I can't afford to build our dream house, and I have no skills at all to put anything together. Uh, but imagine that Richard, and if you guys know Richard Snow, dude can do anything, build anything. He's not going to survive the zombie apocalypse when other people perish because he's got mad skills. Uh, imagine that Richard says to me, hey, Jeff, here's what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to give you all the funds. And I'm going to work with you. I'm never going to leave you alone. I'm going to bring all the skills, all the supplies. I'm going to bring in the people that we need to make this happen. I'm just inviting you to come work with me. Imagine that I then said to Richard, Chuck, you're the same way. You can do it. Imagine, imagine that I said, said to Richard, hey, Richard, uh, man, I, man I, just, I don't think I can. Can you imagine Richard looking at me? I just said I was going to give you everything you need. I was going to work with you. I was going to bring in people to help with us. What, 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 what's the problem? I just don't think I can. You know, I'm not understanding, right? Not understanding what he's offering to provide for me. All right, here, this is the same thing that Jesus is saying when he's talking about this new character and this new life and this new kind of transformation that's gonna happen in us. Uh, it's happening in us because Jesus says, I am now alive in you. The riches of Christ are now alive in you. I am now in Christ. My life is hidden with Christ, Paul said, and he is finding expression in me through his power. It is Christ being expressed in my life. That's what's going on right here. Yeah, we're not simply, these are not nice, simply nice things. This is the life of Jesus. This is who he was. Uh, and the life of Jesus in its fullness is finding expression in us because by his power and by his strength, uh, he is supplying all of our needs so that we are being transformed by him. Uh, and so we read, those, we read those things right there. We don't feel like a, simply a burden to go, oh man, I've got to do all this. No, Jesus, thank you. I've got to pay attention to you because you're doing this in me. Uh, and you're inviting me to be a part of this. Uh, but it's by your power and strength that all these things are going to happen. So that should bring some great anticipation and excitement to us about the things that Christ is going to do in us. Paul goes on then in verse 13, and he says this, Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. All right, uh, pay attention to what Paul is saying. This new community uh, is, is gonna, it's gonna be a community. This new life that we have as new creations is not an individual life. It's a life in community with others. And, and in this new community, uh, people are gonna bear with one another. Uh, and, and to bear with one another simply means that I restrain my natural reaction to people who annoy me or offend me. All right, that's, I mean, that's kind of what bearing, when you're bearing with somebody, it's like, man, ugh, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of restraining my natural reaction to that. Uh, it's going to be a place where we're going to bear with one another, and it's going to be a place of forgiveness. Uh, it, it, it's going to be a place where you're going to be wronged, and you're going to be hurt, and you're going to forgive. Here's what I can tell you. If maybe, maybe we got somebody new in our, in visiting with us in worship this morning. If you come and become a part of this church, you'll have to bear with some people who annoy you and hurt you. Uh, and you have to bear with them and you'll be hurt and offended and you'll have to practice lots of forgiveness in this community, all right? Welcome to Grace, all right? <clears throat> and you're gonna get lots of practice, bearing with others and forgiving them. In fact, that'll just be like honesty and advertising for a church. Come join a group of people who were so messed up that we had to die and be born again. And we're trying to live into this new kind of life and as we're living in this new life, Man, we sometimes hurt and annoy and offend one another, and so you got to practice lots and lots of forgiveness in this. And if you think, uh, and I don't know, because oftentimes we have people who come to church, and then they're like shocked when the Bible tells us over and over again that this community that's being formed is going to be a community where the relationships at times are going to be difficult. We're going to have to practice forgiveness and bearing with one another. Uh, that doesn't mean things horrible, wrong. It just means this is the way that God transforms us. He transforms us in community. Like uh, Paul Tripp gives out a, a word on Wednesdays, and this was out of his word this past Wednesday. He said, the relationships God gives us are not luxuries or vehicles for our own happiness, but a workroom for sanctification, both for us and for the other person we are discipling. Whoa. The relationships God gives us are not just luxuries for our own happiness, but a workroom for sanctification. Listen, if you think, in the, the, in the body of Christ, that our relationships are just for, for your comfort and convenience and are gonna make you happy, you're gonna be disappointed and you're gonna give up and eventually go away. But if you believe that the relationships in this room uh, with others in the body of Christ are for your sanctification to make you holy, um, then you will discover the deeper work that God is doing 
among us. Um, the brokenness is, is part of the way that God is transforming us, learning to bear with one another and forgiving one another, not giving up on one another. It's part of the way that God is transforming our lives. And so we often see that as some kind of horrible thing that, that's, that's keeping the work of God from happening when we have friction in our relationships within the body of Christ. But Paul says, no, this is going to be the way it is. And in the midst of that, God is transforming you and teaching you how to live with others in a gracious and kind way. And what is the reason that we do this? And he says that then, forgive one another. Well, why do we forgive one another? Because Christ has forgiven us. This is bear with one another. Christ is bearing with you right now, all right? Do, we, do, you, do you realize that? There are some things about you that annoy and offend Jesus. And if you don't think Christ is bearing with you, you got big issues, right? I mean, right now, Christ is bearing with you, uh, and, and he is patient with you and kind with you, and he is forgiving you. And, and Paul teaches the same thing that Jesus taught, that we cannot be recipients of this grace and not extend it to others, to be recipients of this grace, but to refuse to extend it to somebody else is to say, no, God, I don't want any more. If you're gonna receive it, you have to share it. And so as those who realize Christ is bearing with me, and there's some things in me, they're all messed up, and he is forgiving me. And so I'm simply sharing that thing that Christ is sharing with me. I'm now sharing it with others. We do this because this is what Christ is doing in us, is the life of Christ being worked out through us. He then says in verse 14, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. The thing that's gonna hold all this life, this new life that we have together, is love is the thing that's gonna do that. And here's what's important to understand about love. And I love the way 1 John puts it, which is why we go here often. He says this, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. All right? The kind of love that we're sharing with one another is a love that is coming from God. It's just passing through us. We are conduits for this kind of love. Love comes from God. And whoever loves has been born of God. Remember last week, Jesus talked about the Pharisees, and he said, you, you're, you're like your father, the devil. And, and 1 John says, man, you are born of God when you are loving. It is, you are like your, this is what the father does. He loves Anyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. In this, this is the way that we see what love looks like. Here it is. This is what love is right here. Here's how it was made manifest. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Here's, here's what love looks like. God gave his son. That's what love looks like. God gave his son to die for a people who were turned away from him. He makes it clear in the next one. In this is love. This is what love is. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation is, is a big giant word. There's a lot there. But he made, it, he made a way for us to be in a right relationship with God. This is what love is. We were turned away from God. Uh, we were rebelling from God. We were spitting in God's face, and God met our deepest need. That's what love is. We were turned away from him. We were working for the other team. Uh, we were spitting in his face. And while we were yet sinners, um, God met our deepest need. This is love. Um, and this kind of love that only comes from God, that's an expression of, uh, of, of God's presence with us, is the thing that binds us together where I say, you know what, I, I, I'm not gonna treat you the way that you treat me. I'm gonna love you because God has given me this love I didn't deserve, I haven't earned. It's just spilled out, and so I'm just sharing with you the love that God has shared with me. He then goes on in verse 15 and says, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. All right, the peace of Christ here is, is not your own personal subjective sense of not being anxious. That's not the peace. Sometimes people say that the peace here is just like, I have peace in my heart. That's not the kind of peace he's talking about. The peace of Christ right here is the peace that Christ has made between all people through Jesus Christ. It's what he was referring to in, in verse 11 of chapter three when he says, here in the body of Christ, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. 
uh, Christ has made peace between all those peoples. Uh, we, we're now one body. We now all belong to one another. This is the peace of Christ that he's saying needs to rule in the body of Christ, in our relationships with one another. The word rule there is like an umpire or a referee. Uh, what's going to rule our lives together is that we all belong to Jesus, and we've all been brought into one body, and we all belong to, to one another. I cannot disown you. I cannot walk away from you. I cannot cut you off because to cut you off is to cut off a piece of my own body. Uh, and so I am ruled by this idea that Christ has now made us one and, and that we're one body. And, and, and that sense of our oneness now is ruling and, and somehow impacting the way that we relate to one another, the way that we forgive one another, the way that we bear with one another. I, mean, as I read that this week. I thought about when Susan and I were uh, younger in our marriage and, and going through tough times. Occasionally, we would just sit down and have a real uh, um, marital, strong marital discussion. Um, and out of that, we numerous times came to the place where we said, uh, we're married. Um, we're going to be married. Uh, we're going to be miserable or we're going to be happily married. Let's choose happy uh, because the rule that was for us is that we're married. God made us one. God made us one. We're going to be married. <laughs> Let's choose to fight our way into something that brings us out of the pit that we were in at that moment. Right? And so the same thing, in, in our oneness, uh, listen, what we're going to do is we're not going to give up on one another. We're not going to cut one another off. No, the peace of Christ, the fact that we've all become one, that you belong to Christ and I belong to Christ, is going to rule in our relationships with one another. So we're, we're going to fight for this uh, and for one another uh, to, to express that oneness that was so important to Paul. Because for Paul, the oneness of the body of Christ was a Tremendous witness to the reality of Christ's death and resurrection. Uh, all these different people from different places who annoy and offend one another, yet who are forgiving one another and bearing with one another and calling each other brother and sister in Christ, that unity out of that great diversity uh, was, a, was a sign of the kingdom that is to come. Uh, where all people are going to be made one and we're going to love each other again. And so that's what Paul is fighting for right here. He then says in verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The word of Christ is chapters one and two of Colossians. It's what you have been taught about who you are and who Jesus is. What is now true about you? Let that truth now dwell in you. You could, you could put meditate, uh, meditate upon this. You know that we are all good meditators. I mean, every single one of us are great meditators. And, and the word I, I like and, uh, to, to remind people of what meditation is, it, meditation is how a cow eats. A cow chews on something and then swallows it and then vomits it up and, and, he, and chews on it some more. And he grinds it up a little more, and then he swallows it and kind of lets it ruminate around a little bit more in that next stomach. And then he vomits it up again in his mouth, and he chews on it again, right? That's meditating on something. You're all pretty good at that, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, yeah you, you meditate on, there are some things you meditated on. You chewed it around, you thought about, you forgot about it, and then you vomited it back up in your brain, and you thought about it some more, you thought all the ways it could go wrong. Uh, you thought all the ways those people had hurt you. I mean, you were, you were meditating and dwelling on some things. Most of us are just meditating and dwelling on the wrong things. And, and Paul says, hey, you, you want something to chew on. Chew on this. The riches of Christ have been given to you. Chew on that. Chew on that. All the old distinctions, rich and poor, black and white, whatever it is, Republican, different, done away with in the body of Christ. We're all one. Christ has made peace in the body. Dwell on that. Dwell on that. Think about this. Christ is the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer of all things. If he takes off his hand, nothing is. He alone is. Dwell on that. Dwell on this. He said, let these be the things that you're dwelling on and you're meditating on. And it doesn't mean that we stick our head in the sand about all the other things in life. No, we acknowledge those things, but then we come back 
to those things that are foundational and true, and we dwell on this. And he says, as you're doing that, man, what's going to happen then is there's going to be a singing of songs and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart. The singing in the body of Christ is an expression of our praise and gratefulness to God. Yeah, the, the body of Christ has always been a singing body from the very beginning. It's been a singing body. And, and, and our singing and, and our, our, our singing songs to him is an expression of our gratefulness and praise. Uh, our singing, it's about him. Uh, it's about giving God something that God clearly likes. Uh, you know, I, I don't, whether you like singing or not, I don't know. Some of you do, some of you don't. God likes it. I read the Bible. God loves his people singing to him. And, and when we sing to him, it's about him. It's not about us. That's why one of the crazy things at some churches, not our church, but at some churches, people walk out and go, did you like the music? They're like, no, I didn't like that music today. Isn't that a crazy question? It's like it's your birthday party. I didn't like it. You know, like, 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 we were, like, like the band was thinking, man, Tom, what, what are we, let, we going to sing Tom's favorite songs? I hope Tom likes the music this week. That's not, what the, that's not what Abby's thinking about when she's picking the songs and praying about it. You know, but that's a crazy question. Did I like the music? It's not about you, right? And, and so the question that we ought to be walking out of church saying is, is did, God like, uh, did God like my expression of praise to him today? Did God like the music? Now, if God doesn't like the music, and you go, man, God hated that music. We ought to talk about that. <laughs> that that's bad, all right? But it's not whether you like it or not. Uh, some people say, I don't like to sing. Guess what? It's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about you. Um, and it's, it's out of this, we, we, we recognize who he is out of gratefulness and thankfulness to God. We give God something that God loves that's not at all about us or what we like or whether we like the songs or not. So we walk out of here after worship on Sunday saying, God, from a grateful heart, did I give you something you wanted that you like? Um, and for some of y'all, that feels good and you love it. For others, you're like, man, I don't like it, but God likes it, so here I go, all right? That's called being in relationship, right? I don't like it. This is not my love language, but it obviously appeals to God, and so I'm going to give you something, God, that you love. And so we're singing psalms to him and, and praising him. And finally, in verse 17, it says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything. All right, do you hear this right here? Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything. What is Paul trying to get at right here? What's left out of that? Nothing. I mean, he, he's repeating himself three times in everything. Word or deed, do everything. I mean, every single aspect of your life. What part of your life does Paul say is not spiritual? What part of your life is secular and not sacred? What does Paul think about the walls that we build between things God cares about and things God doesn't care about? Well, what, is, what does Paul think about the things we say are spiritual versus the things that are not spiritual? The things that belong in the kingdom of God and are done for the glory of God and the things over here that are in my kingdom that are just mine. Paul says none of, the, none of those walls exist. He says do everything, do everything uh, for the glory and as a representative of Christ. And, and so here's, here's now our privilege uh, for Paul. It's like you now represent Christ. You are his ambassadors, and under his authority, uh, do everything. We're going to see next week. Paul says he means in your home as well, not just at church on Sunday, but in your home and in your businesses and where you work and where you play and wherever you are. And when, when you're by yourself, when you're with other people, do everything, do everything as a representative and for the glory of Christ. Uh, that's the privilege uh, that God gives to us. Filled with the riches of Christ. We're invited into this new life uh, where God is glorified because we have put on Christ. It is what Christ is doing in us, filling us with joy and excitement. And this is the things Christ is doing in me. But he's going to give me his love, and his compassion, and meekness, humility, kindness, all these things. Yes, Jesus, I want all these things. And, and Jesus says, then just, just listen to me and follow me uh, and trust me as, as I give you this life. Uh, that the only I can give, um, and, and, and endure at times, persevere in the body of Christ. Through the hurt and the brokenness, the fracturedness, the, the weakness of the body of Christ, trust that these things are shaping us, not, not taking us farther away from him, 
But if we trust him and work with him, they're bringing us closer to him. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the privilege of walking with you. And Lord, I, I, I praise you that you've not simply told us some things to do. You've held out your hand and said, uh, you're mine. Uh, you, you're, you're walking with us. Uh, you're filling us with your riches, with your presence. Um, you, you're, you're not leaving us. Um, you're, uh, you're working through us. Uh, Lord, we, we're becoming the conduits of your life and your grace and your beauty and your strength, all these things. Lord, help us to believe that uh, and, and to look up and to dwell upon you, uh, to dwell richly upon your words. And so, Father, forgive us in this past week when we